Good evening. My name is Professor Jonathan L. Walton. I am the Plummer Professor of Christian Morals and Pusey Minister here in the Memorial Church. And I would like to welcome you all to the 2015 William Belden Noble Lecture. This annual lecture was established in 1898 by Nanny Yuli Noble in memory of her husband, William. William Belden Noble was a student at Harvard Divinity School who passed away while preparing for a career in ministry. Since that time, Harvard has welcomed some of the leading intellectuals to expound upon major themes of faith and public life. Past noble lectures have included Theodore Roosevelt in 1911, Harvey Cox in 1968, author Kathleen Norris in 2001, and artist Janet McKenzie in 2013. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome Mr. Stanley Nelson, Jr. He is our 2015 Nobel Lecturer. Stanley Nelson is a storyteller. He is a historical archaeologist. This is to say Mr. Nelson uses the power of film to document the American experience. Yet he digs deep to unearth never-before tales and discover new layers of complexity about the stories we thought we knew, particularly stories about courageous freedom fighters who've helped the United States close the gap between its democratic aspirations and its often unjust realities. Mr. Nelson has produced more than 20 documentary films, directed over a dozen, and written his fair share of those. His creative and keen eye through his camera has earned him five primetime Emmys, two awards from the Sundance Film Festival, two Peabody's, as well as a MacArthur Genius Award. This semester, we screened three of his films, the Massacre at Wounded Knee, Freedom Riders, and Freedom Summer. His detective work as a filmmaker allows us to see never-before footage and testimonies that he gathers from disparate spaces such as the FBI and everyday people. In fact, his 2003 documentary, The Murder of Emmett Till, helped propel the U.S. Department of Justice to reopen this 1955 murder case in Mississippi. Such social, cultural, and political contributions led to President Obama awarding Mr. Nelson with the National Humanities Medal in 2013. Now, rather than adhering to a standard lecture format tonight, Mr. Nelson has agreed to have a conversation with another storyteller the Lincoln Professor of History, and the 28th President of Harvard University, Drew Gilpin Faust. President Faust came of age in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and attended college during the tumultuous periods of social change which Mr. Nelson chronicles. In recent weeks, she shared her own account right here in the church about skipping her freshman final exams at Bryn Mawr to head to Selma to join civil rights protesters. As a historian of the American South and Civil War period, President Faust's meticulous accounts of race, gender, and power in the slaveholding South and Civil War eras served as the basis for Rick Burns' Emmy-nominated PBS documentary, Death and the Civil War. This is why it is a real privilege and pleasure to have President Faust join us to interview our own special guest and noble lecturer, Mr. Stanley Nelson. President Faust and Mr. Nelson will discuss his work and selected clips for just under an hour. And then around 8 o'clock, we will open up for questions for an additional 15 to 20 minutes. We have distributed index cards uh, for you to write down your questions and then pass them forward to Alana in the back in an orange shirt. She'll make her way to the front when it's Q&A time. 
And then immediately following this, we invite you to join us for a wine and cheese reception in the memorial room. We have a handful of Mr. Nelson's DVDs on hand to purchase. So without further ado, I now present to you our 2015 Nobel Lecturer, Mr. Stanley Nelson and President Drew Faust. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a great privilege and honor for me to be here. I have lots of questions I'm really curious about, and I welcome this opportunity since I'm a real fan of your films. I thought we might begin by just talking a little bit about your life and what brought you to film, what made you decide that this was the path you wanted to pursue, what kinds of influences or pulls were there that led you into this work? Yeah, I think there, there were a couple of things that led me in, into filmmaking. I, um, you know, I grew up in New York City, and um, I grew up at a time, and, and you know, this is hard sometimes for people to believe who, who are a lot younger than me, but I grew up at a time when you didn't see African Americans um, on television, in films, um, you didn't see Asians, you didn't see Latinos, uh, you didn't see anybody who was gay, you know, unless they were being made fun of in, in films or on TV at all. Um, and then as I was in college in 1969 or so, 70, you know, there started to be these films made, these black exploitation films, and all of a sudden, you know, there were films made with, with some black people in them now, you know, but they were films like Blackula and Superfly, and Shaft and, and, and the main characters a lot of times were, you know, pimps and hustlers and those kind of things. And those weren't the people that I knew, you know, growing up. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, a lot of those films really weren't that good. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do that. I can make a bad film, but I can make it about people, the people that I know. Um, and I'd always had this kind of interest in filmmaking, so I took a film class. I was, you know, bouncing around school, and I took a film class, and I liked it, and, and just kind of stuck with it. And you've often mentioned William Greaves as mm -hmm. a major influence. Could you tell us something about him and the kind of um, impact he had on you? Sure. Uh, you know, Bill Greaves was really the first African American to kind of have his own film company. He had a, he had gone. He had started out as kind of a, an actor and, and had been in some, black, some early black films, you know, some, some early black films in the 40s. Um, and then he went up to Canada and trained at, with the Canadian Film Board because that was the only place that he could get any training. And then he had his own kind of documentary company. And the story is really funny. I, I, I had gotten out of film school and I was just knocking on doors. I was literally, there was a, a film magazine that had all the film companies listed in New York. And, I was just knocking on one door, I was just going down the list and knocking on a door and saying, can you hire me, can you hire, you know, and, and I was just getting rounds of no's. And it was, you know, about six o'clock in the evening and I called my mother because I wanted to go over there and get a free meal, you know. So I called my mother and I said, you know, can I come over for dinner? She said, yeah, but I just read this article in the paper about this black filmmaker named William Greaves. You should go see him. And I said, okay, and I was in a phone booth. This was, of course, there were no cell phones then, and, and so I um, looked up his address, I looked up William Greaves, and I was two blocks away from his office. So I went and I knocked on his door, and um, I said, you know, I'm looking for a job, and Bill Greaves like, oh, no, 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 I can't hire you. you know, I don't have any money to hire you. And I had heard about this government program called CETA, and I, I said, you know, CETA was a program um, that would, basically the government would pay you to do almost anything as long as the person who hired you agreed to, after the CETA money ran out, which was like six months, that they would hire you at the rate of salary, you know, in the industry. So, I mean, they, they, you could do anything with CETA. My, my brother was a shellfish warden on Martha's Vineyard with CETA, so you could do almost anything. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, Bill, there's this program, CETA, that, that, that will pay me for six months, so you don't have to pay me. And he's like, oh, that sounds pretty good. But um, what about after six months? I don't, have to, I don't want to hire you. And I said, well, okay, Bill, well, after six months, hire me and then fire me. And you get six months worth, worth, worth of free work if you do it that way. 
And he said, okay, you know, uh, my son David is over there. He's going to get some equipment. We're shooting tomorrow. Go with him and let's go. And so that's how I, I started, you know, working with Bill. Um, and after that, you know, after six months, he ended up hiring me to do some other, a lot of other stuff. So he, he's made a lot of films that are documentary right. black history films. Did that interest you in that particular genre? Or are there aspects of the way he made those films that you can see reflected in your own work? You know, I, I, think, I think more important for me, for the, one of the great lessons I learned from Bill was he, he was a black man who had a film company. You know, he had a family. He had a nice house. You know, he, was, he was actually making a living making mm -hmm. documentary films. And, you know, I, I, saw, I saw an example. You, know, you could of, do this. Of, of, yeah. Of, yeah, you know, it was the, the thing that people talk about, role models. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden I saw how it could be done. And, um, you know, that's what helped, helped mm -hmm. me start out. I've been struck that amidst the many, many films you've made, there's a series that's kind of an arc of a narrative of black liberation, the civil rights movement, now the Black Panthers film. And I just like to explore those films a little bit. The first was the Emmett Till film, mm -hmm. in my view, of this group. And then there's Freedom Riders, and then there's Freedom Summer. And soon there will be Black Panthers. And that covers a period beginning in the mid-1950s up until the late 70s. I don't know how far the Black Panthers <laughs> film goes because I haven't seen it, but up until um, several decades later. And as you tell that story, uh, it strikes me that this is such an important legacy message to tell these stories at a time when people like John Lewis are getting older and people who lived it and people who actually remember those times mm -hmm. are becoming less numerous, right. me being one, and um, also older. Is that something in your mind? Do you feel this is something you want to capture for a generation that hasn't experienced it? I mean, there are probably more people alive, many more people alive today who don't remember uh -huh. Freedom Summer and Freedom Riders era than there are people who do. Well, you know, we have a joke around the office because what happened is, is every film that we've made that, that you've mentioned, somebody has passed away. And it, with the Panther film that we just finished, four people that we interviewed in the film wow. have passed away since we started the film. And so, you know, the, we always joke like if, if, if I call you and I want to interview you, say Watch no. Watch out. Yeah, <laughs> say no because you don't know what's going to happen. But I, I think that, you know, I think that one of the ways I look at it is, is you've got the eyewitnesses, you know, who are still around and who can tell these stories. And for so many of the people, um, you know, the, the Freedom Rides and Freedom Summer and the Panther Movement, these were huge things in their life, lives, you know, and nobody asks them day to day about it. You know, there were people who were on the, on the Freedom Rides who risked their lives and went to jail and risked beatings that, you know, did not become great, famous people, you know? And so a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, Stanley, you, know, you, you do these great interviews, you're such a great interviewer. But sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm doing these interviews and I'm actually trying to get people to stop talking, you know, rather than to keep talking because they have this chance to talk about part of their lives and, and they just go for it. And, and it's almost like they go back in time and become that person that they were, you know, mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50 years ago. So um, it's just exciting. And, and then I think also, you know, the, the, the film footage and the, and the pictures from those times are just, you know, it's kind of this magical period where it's, it's old enough, but there's actually a lot of great yeah. pictures and a lot of great footage from those times. So let's look at some of that. Should we start yeah. with um, Freedom Riders, the very beginning part of the film, the first clip? Um, can I say something right before yep. we start? Please. One, one of the things that, that we wanted to, we're going to watch the very beginning of Freedom Riders, if for those who haven't seen it. One of the things we wanted to do was, was to really make this film, make it cinematic as a documentary, to really make it a film. And so um, you'll see some of that when we started with this neon um, at night because we just love the way it looks. I mean, neon at night, you know, it has this thing that it does that, that we loved. And then we also wanted, you'll see in the first few minutes, we kind of 
we kind of wanted to like throw out all the tools that we had in the toolkit. You know, here, here's everything we got. You know, we, we have all this stuff, and if you just kind of stick with us, we're going to use all these things as the film goes on. So that's kind of the first few minutes, one of the things we were trying to do. I wish to apply for acceptance as a participant in CORE's Freedom Ride, 1961. To travel via bus from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, Louisiana, and to test and challenge segregated facilities en route. I understand that I should be participating in a nonviolent protest against racial discrimination, that arrest or personal injury to me might result the Freedom Rides of 1961 were a simple but daring plan. The Congress of Racial Equality came up with the idea to put blacks and whites in small groups on commercial buses, and they would deliberately violate the segregation laws of the Deep South. We were to go through various parts of the South, gradually going deeper and deeper, six of us on the Trailways bus and six of us on the Greyhound bus and see whether places were segregated, whether people were being served when they went to get something to eat or buy a ticket or use the restrooms. One of the major thrusts of the Freedom Ride was to get the movement into the Deep South. Most, most of the action up to, up to this time had been in the Upper South or in the North. And one of the ideas here was to go into the deepest South we were hoping that this would start a national movement. CORE had this set itinerary. They anticipated that this would be a two-week trip, that it would culminate down in New Orleans with a real celebration on the anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And there's almost an element of naivete attached to it, how easily they thought it would go. I'm a senior at American Baptist Theological Seminary and hope to graduate in June. I know that an education is important, and I hope to get one. But at this time, human dignity is the most important thing in my life, that justice and freedom might come to the Deep South. I have no doubt that the Negro basically knows that the best friend he's ever had in the world is a southern white man. We talk about it here as separation of the races. Customs and traditions that have been built up over the last hundred years that have proved for the best interests of both the colored and the white people. There's not been one single change. The colored man knows where he stands. The white man knows where he stands. We have signs saying colored and white. The colored man knows that he is not to enter there. <coughs> so you said you threw the whole toolkit. Help us understand what some of the tools were that we just saw. Well, as, as the film goes on, you know, we, we use more maps. You know, we have the maps. We have the, uh, the, the, the shot of the bus, the wheels of the bus, and we do a whole bunch of stuff with that. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we have footage, we have stills, we have the music, we have, you know, all of those things. We have the, the reading of the letters, the, the, the graphic of the letters coming on. Um, we wanted to throw out all of those things, things at once to, to you know, to kind of glue Set you. Set the themes. Yeah, and, then, and, also, yeah. and also this kind of say, okay, wait, you know, there's, there, there's, there's, there's more, there's more here. It, it's not, because, you know, one of the things that, that, that happened at first for us with this film was, you know, um, we, when we actually applied to Sundance, one of the programmers at Sundance, who, you know, the film premiered at Sundance, but, you know, he said, you know, I have to tell you, Stanley, that the film was sitting there on my table 
for a month before I looked at it because I was like, I know this stuff already. You know, I've seen enough about the civil rights movement. So we were trying to show, say, you know, filmatically that, you know, that this was going to be visually and, and orally an exciting mm -hmm. film. It was going to be more than, than, than just, you know, um, some pictures thrown up and some talking heads. We wanted to give you that sense right on, from, right from the beginning. So one of the things that I, as a historian, love very much about this is the way you use the documents. Uh -huh. And it's been said about you that you are an absolutely dedicated archivist, researcher, that you find extraordinary film footage, you find um, documents that you then have here, the different protagonists reading from something that had such a big effect on their lives, but they probably haven't seen those words in 50 years. So tell me how you think about approaching a film, the, the research you do before you get to this period and, and how you undertake that. Yeah, I, mean, I think that the, one of the things I'm trying to do is always find new and, and, and different stuff and new and different ways to present stuff. You know, when I watch the beginning of that and we have them all reading their application letters, you know, I, I, I'm still amazed by that and amazed that it worked, you know. I mean, it was just something that we did, you know. We had, I saw the, I, we had the application letter, we had found it, and at the end of the interview, I just said, well, you know, why don't you read the first paragraph of it? And we did that with three or four people. And, you know, it just kind of worked, you know. It was this idea, uh, a lot of times, you know, you have ideas and, and they don't work. Or you have ideas and you're scared to try them, you know, or for whatever reason, you don't try them. And I've learned that, you know, just try it and see what happens. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you don't use it. Um, and I think one of the reasons why, I'll tell a little story if I can, Please. about why I'm so, so dedicated to, to the research. The first film that I ever did was a film called Two Dollars in a Dream about Madam C.J. Walker and her daughter Lilia Walker, who had a cosmetic company. And we were looking for music um, about black women's hair because that was their, the basis of their company was they were working with black women's hair. So we were looking for um, music, you know, and we actually had a long list of, 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 of just words, you know, like, you know, brown or, or colored or black or curly or kinky. You know, we were just, you know, looking for anything we could find. And I talked to this woman um, who was a, a musicologist who dealt with women, the, the images of women in, in music. And I, she, had, she had actually, so she had put out this record called um, The Wild Women Blues. And it was a old days of records and it had a, you know, a bunch of songs by women, kind of, you know, outspoken women from, from the 20s and 30s. And uh, it was, her name was Rosetta Wrights. And, you know, at, on, on the record cover it said, you know, compiled by Rosetta Wrights, New York City, New York. So I looked it up in the phone book and Rosetta Wrights was in the phone book and we talked. And I went and saw her and, and we started talking and she said, you know, I told her what I was trying to do. She said, there's a song, I've heard about this song called Nappy Headed Blues. But I've, ne you know, I've never heard the song. I don't know what it is, but I've heard that there's a song called Nappy Headed Blues. And this was in 1985 or something. So there's no internet, there's nothing like that. And so I'm looking for this, and she might have given me a name of a couple of uh, other kind of record collectors or music collectors. And I start, you know, um, calling them and writing them. And, you know, the film, it took me seven years to make the film. I should say that. So it took me seven years to make this film. So all through this five-year process, you know, I'm, I'm writing and calling and writing different people. And finally, I get to this guy. Somehow, he's in Vancouver. And I'm talking to him on the phone, and I'm saying, you know, I heard about this song called Nappy Headed Blues, you know? I, I'm wondering, you know, I'm talking to him about a lot of things, and, you know, but I say finally, you know, Nappy Headed Blues. And he says, oh yeah, I got it. And I'm like, wow, you have it? He says, yeah, I have, I have the record, 1925, Helen Humes. And I'm like, really? And I said, well, I'd love to hear it. He said, well, send me $5. <laughs> 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 and I find I'll send you a cassette tape. So I sent him five dollars, I get the cassette tape, and I put it in, and I'm listening to it, and the first verse is, you know, my hair is can't you, don't you, you can't comb it, don't you try. Nappy, that's the reason why. You know, and I'm cracking up, you know, I'm like, oh, well, this is really, this is kind of, you know, funny, because the, the film, I, we always thought of, of, of the Madam Walker film as kind of a quasi-comedy. So anyway, so, you know, so we're, we're, I'm listening to it, and then, 
The last verse is uh, going to Madam Walker, send her a $50 bill. Going to Madam Walker, send her a $50 bill, said, please help a young girl, if you will. Wow. And, I, you know, I mean, I sweat like popped up <laughs> on my head, and I'm like, ah, what? Yeah, I can't believe this. And that taught me a lesson. You know, this is the first real film I ever made, but, you know, just by continuing to look, and I always tell everybody I'm look, working with, and they think I'm crazy because I say this, but I say, you know, you have to continue to look. You have to continue to look with a positive attitude and an open mind, and good things will happen. You know, and you never know what you're going to find. So the next clip shows <laughs> another very good luck <laughs> discovery, uh, among other things. So let's run the next clip, and then there'll be another story about an amazing find that Stanley has made. Okay, so this is, uh, real quick, this is for just a little further on. In, in Freedom Riders, they they have these, these this group of people have now gone got on up there on public buses and they've ridden down into the South and they've gotten to now they just got into the Deep South. They're in uh, Anniston, Alabama. And just so everybody knows, we have a monitor here, so we're looking at a monitor. Yeah, we're we looking at see, we're not just staring into space here. We're <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we heard that sickening sound of tires going flat. There was a commotion outside. So I walked to the front of the store to see if I could tell what was going on. The bus driver came out, and he went out to look at the tires. And when he realized how flat and hopeless they were, he just walked away from the bus and just left all the passengers to fend for themselves. He just walked away. We were now in the hands of this mob. It didn't look good for us. I'm like everyone else on the bus. I'm, I'm pretty afraid, okay? That's putting it mildly. I watched as a man raised his arm above the crowd with a crowbar and he broke out one of the back windows of the bus. You could hear him say, throw it in, throw it in, and asking, where is the gas, where is the gas? The hand went down, and when it came back up, it had some object in it that he threw into that hole. And there was immediate flash fire on the bus. Pretty soon, the whole back of the bus was black. You couldn't even see in front of your face. So I ran up to the front of the bus, and I tried to open the door. Only thing I could hear is, let's burn them niggas. Let's burn them niggas alive. At that moment, the fuel tank exploded. I heard somebody say, it's going to go. It's going to go. And they ran, and that was the only way we could get that door open. The door burst open and people just spilled out into the yard. They were practically tripping over each other because they were so sick and they needed to get some air. I can't tell you if I walked off the bus or if I crawled off or someone pulled me off. When I got off the bus, a man came up to me and I'm coughing and strangling. He said, boy, you all right? And I nodded my head, and the next thing I knew, I was on the ground. He had hit me with a part of a baseball bat. People were gagging, and they were crawling around on the ground. They were trying to get the smoke out of their chest. It was just an awful, 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 awful scene. It was horrible. It was like a scene from a hell. It was, it was the worst suffering I'd ever heard. Yeah, I heard water. Please give me water. Oh God, I need water. I walked right out into the middle of that crowd. I picked me out one person. I washed her face. I held her. <laughs> I gave her water to drink. And as soon as I thought she was going to be OK, I got up and picked out somebody else.
As I'm getting up off the ground, four or five guys coming at me again. And this is when I see the highway patrolman. He pulls his gun and he fired in the air. He says, okay, you've had your fun. Let's move back. And that's was stop, what stopped it. So this amazing footage at the end of the bus actually burning has an interesting story. So tell us about that footage. Yeah, um, you, you know, we were doing research in, in, into the um, whole Freedom Rides, and, and after this incident, the FBI did, held hearings. Of course, you know, they didn't find anybody to convict of anything, but the FBI held hearings. And you know, we were reading through the transcript of the hearings, and there was this one guy who they called to the stand, and we were reading it, and we were like, like, we didn't recognize his name. And it turns out he was someone who lived down the road from this. And he says in his testimony, my, my son, when we heard the commotion, my son ran out, and we had just given him an eight millimeter camera for his birthday, and he uh, shot these, scenes uh, of the bus burning, but I don't have the footage anymore because the FBI confiscated the footage. So we're like, wow. So we call the FBI and we ask the FBI, you know, do you have this footage? And they said, we don't know what you're talking about, any footage. So we Xerox the copy, the, the, the page of the transcript we scanned it and sent it to the FBI and said, here's the testimony of this guy who says you all took the footage. And they say, oh, okay, we'll get right back to you. And uh, six months later, they call and say, okay, so we found the footage, do you want it? We said, yeah, <laughs> send it. <laughs> and so that's what it was. And I think that, you know, I, cause I, you know, I've thought a lot about it and been asked about it. And I think what happened was that the FBI felt so embarrassed that it was like this thing for them to find the footage. You know what I mean? Like if they confiscated it, then they had to have it. And if they had to have it, then they had to be able to find it because they're the FBI. So <laughs> <laughs> they found it they, and, and, and gave it to us and we're like, you know, you know, well, you know, how much do we have to pay? They said, no, nah, it's, you know. Amazing story. Public record. Divine intervention, I think. <laughs> Got that to you. When we were talking yesterday, you spoke about how you saw the voice of this woman who was then a little girl giving water to the people being attacked on the bus, why you thought that was such an important element in the film. And I, I found that really interesting. Would you say a little more about that? Sure, sure. I should say that 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 because we picked up the story, you know, in the middle, the, the woman who gives them water, she was a twelve year old child at the time. And I have to say that, you know, we had heard this story and, you know, I hadn't filmed her. We, she was like the last interview that we filmed. Cause we were like, do we really need this? Do we, you know, and that was divine intervention that just somehow, you know, just was like, okay, let's film, film her. And I think she's really important to the story. You know, if you see the film, because she says that even in the midst of this craziness in Alabama, you know, there is goodness. And that even in, in the midst of this craziness, there's this child who has not been, you know, um, uh, she hasn't been so influenced by this culture that she, she doesn't know not to help people who are suffering. So she sees these people suffering and she runs out and, and gives them water. Um, and then, you know, as the film goes on, I mean, she actually gets ostracized and her family actually moves away from, from the town because of the fact that she gave them water. So I wanna move on to the next film, but we have not done justice to this film. Everybody should go buy it immediately after we finish talking to each other. It is a magnificent film. So let's talk about Freedom Summer. We'll look at the very beginning of that. Do you wanna say something before it? 
it runs. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things for, that's really interesting for me, you know, and, and I, I think there's some, some film students or film people in here, or everybody, viewers, I'm always really interested in the way films start. You know, I just am, you know, it's just like, how do you start? How do you start a book? You know, how do you, where do you, how do you start? You know, and so I, I'm just really interested in, 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 in how things start and, and, you know, how you draw people, try to draw people into the story. So, you know, in, in, in Freedom Summer, we were trying to give some background information, you know, on, because so many people, you know, when, when you make a, a, a film, a documentary film like this, you know, people are coming from all different places. So you have, as you say, you have young people who, who don't even know what segregation was. We showed Freedom Riders to a group of high school students in New York and they said afterwards, I didn't know that slavery still existed in the 60s. <laughs> it's like, you know, they, they don't have any idea. And then you're dealing with, you know, people who, who were part of the movement, who were, who were there. Um, so you know you you want to try to figure you have to figure out a way so that everybody can be drawn into the story and I think that's what we were trying to do here. Well, one of the aspects of Freedom Summer that I thought was so wonderful when I watched it is that so much of the narrative about that has focused on the white volunteers, <laughs> and you begin this by situating them in a tradition of engagement in act, black activism and black leadership, and I think throughout the film, you get that juxtaposition so much more appropriately situated with the, what the white kids were there for, what the limits of their abilities were, and the long engagement by the black community and the aspect of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and so forth. So I think part of the beginning of this is setting, in my view, was setting that balance right at the very outset. No, I, th I think that, that, that that's great of, of you to say that. I mean, one of the things that I think that I have to say is, you know, we, we worked with, with um, uh, a lot of the groups uh, uh, of, of, of the black people in the South who were part of, of the Freedom Summer movement, and they were great. I mean, they were, you know, and they really held our feet to the fire and said, you know, you can't tell this film and just tell it from the white kid's point of view. And because, you know, that's the way the story is told so many times that, you know, these thousand white kids go down to, to Mississippi and, and, you know, kind of save these black people and get them the, the right to vote when you know, the, the black people in Mississippi had been fighting for you know, 100 years for the right to vote. Um, and, that, you know, and, and so it's, it's a delicate balance because the white kids who went down there, you can't belittle what they did. I mean, you know, um, you know uh, uh, Schwerner and Goodman died you know, because of you know, volunteering and, and you know, they, they were incredibly, incredibly brave. So how do you, you know, tell this other story too without belittling the, the heroics uh, 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 of these white college kids, you know, basically college kids who went down there. Um, and so that was something that, that, that we were constantly thinking about. And I think, you know, you're right, we wanted to set that up in the beginning because the story is really the story of three groups. It's, it's the white volunteers, mostly college kids who went down there. It's the black Mississippians, but it's also the kind of the first wave of Bob Moses and, and, and the SNCC workers who were down there, you know, early on by themselves. And we really wanted to make sure that, that it was understood that it was all these groups together that made Freedom Summer what it was and made Freedom Summer successful. And you can't say that any one group was braver than the other. These were three, you know, um, incredible, incredible groups of people. So let's look at how Freedom Summer begins. Hear that freedom train a coming. Hear that freedom train a coming. Well, hear that freedom train a coming. Spending a summer in Mississippi taught me a lot about this country. My high school social studies teacher taught me that we all have rights. Uh, Mississippi Summer taught me that we didn't all have rights. They'll be coming by the thousand. When we began to go to Mississippi, the black people we met there were not interested in lunch counters. They weren't interested in uh, sitting in the front of the bus. Uh, there were no lunch counters. There were no buses. They wanted to vote. 
it'll be carrying registered voters. It'll be carrying registered voters. I just made up my mind that I was going to be a registered voter. I never wanted to be a politician. I just wanted the right to vote. I don't want the nigger as I have known him and contacted him during my lifetime to control the making of the law that controls me, to control the government under which I live. I don't think people understand how violent Mississippi was. Terrorism led black people to the obvious conclusion. If they try and vote, they're messing with white folks' business, and they can get hurt or killed. We hope to send into Mississippi this summer upwards of 1,000 students from all around the country who will engage in what we're calling freedom schools, community center programs, voter registration activity, and in general, uh, uh, a program designed to open up Mississippi to the country. The burned out station wagon in which the three civil rights workers were last seen has been processed by FBI laboratory investigators. I knew it, it was gonna be bad. I didn't dream for a minute that people would be killed. But it was always in the back of everybody's mind that something, that things, bad things were going to happen. Uh, so it was terrifying. But if you cared about this country and you cared about democracy, then you had to go down. So you spoke about music in the Madame Walker film, and music obviously plays a huge role in both um, Freedom Riders and this film, and we've heard some of it here. Talk about how you think about music as you make films. Well, first I should say that you know I'm a music lover. You know, I am one of those people that just has music on all the time. I, you know, um, so I, I, I really like music, and 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 I think you know one of the things I heard, I, and I, I could be wrong about the play, but you know I don't know. I I, I heard this. I don't know, somewhere, that you know that that one of the things that happened. I, I believe it was the play Oklahoma. That one of the things about that play that 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 changed the way musical theater was done was that in 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 the play instead of the play stopping and them dancing and then starting again, that the music moved the play forward. You know, it was part. It helped move the play forward. Um, and so I always remembered that idea. So I, I always am trying to think about how music can help move the film forward, you know, and, and, and be a real piece of the film and not just, you know, something in the background. But, you know, and not always. Sometimes, you know, we just have what we call movie music that just, you know, it's a little mm -hmm. tension music as the bus is burning. But sometimes we have songs like um, uh, the song that, that starts this, this film um, that, that really, is a piece of the story. Um, and so um, that, that was another piece, that, that song, um, Hear That Freedom Train Coming, um, where you know, we were looking for, for songs about um, Freedom Summer. And uh, we found, uh, we had someone who was helping us do research, and she found the sheet music from the song. And she didn't, we couldn't find a recording of the song, so she found the sheet music. So we had a guy who was composing the music. So I said, "Well, just play it for me. You know, what does it sound like? You know." And and he played it, and and I was like, "Yeah, that sounds pretty good." And so we got this woman who you hear in the beginning to sing, and that's kind of him on, on the organ, because um, he had just bought a Hammond B3 organ, so he he really <laughs> wanted to put it in, and it fit. So um, that's actually you know, and that was kind of the first time we had we had heard the song because we just couldn't we couldn't find. Uh, a recording of it, but it was written, you know, for Freedom Summer. For Freedom Summer. And just to note, you don't ever use narration in films, or mostly not? I mean, does music in some sense substitute for 
the omniscient narrator? It helps. It helps. I think, you know, um, I mean, I, we've used narration in a lot of films. You know, Murder of Emmett Till has, has narration mm -hmm. of black person. We used, um, in the last few films we've made, um, we haven't used narration, um, partially because, you know, we, we're, we're coming closer to now in, in terms mm -hmm. of, of some of the films we made. So, so there's a lot, lot of eyewitnesses um, and, and uh, who are vibrant people. And we're like, well, you know, let's try to do it, See if you can do it without, without, without narration. I think uh, Wounded Knee um, that, that was shown here has narration. We tried to make that film without narration, but we just couldn't do it. It just was so complicated. And there was so much kind of backstory mm -hmm. within that film. You know, it's about the takeover of, of Wounded Knee in 19. 73, the town of Wounded Knee, but there was so much backstory, you know, so like why would a group of Indians, you know, take over this little town, you know, in Dakota, for, you know, it, it was just too much to try to tell, um, you know, with just, with, with just the people who were there. There was so much that we had to, had to go back and tell. So I want to make sure we have time for questions, so I want to go on to the sure. next clip, which also has a musical theme that, yeah. that we can focus on as well. Okay, so real quick, yep. um, this is l later on in the summer. Um, the three civil rights workers, um, uh, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, have dis they disappeared the first day of Freedom Summer. The, the day, first day Freedom Summer was to begin, uh, they disappeared, and the whole summer had been spent with that shadow of, of, of these three, three men who had disappeared and the bodies had never been found and, or nothing had ever been found and nobody knew what had happened to them. So that's kind of something that, that, that had colored the whole, whole summer up to this point. On August 4th, 1964, at the Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church in Meridian, Mississippi, Pete Siegel gave a concert. Uh, you know, we were all into James Brown and, and all that and here, you know, we got a guy who's a folk legend that comes to Meridian, and and we were told that he's going to do do this concert. It was a small church, so there were about 200 people there, and I'd been singing to them, I guess, on a slight raised platform, probably near the pulpit, and I'd gotten them singing with me. And all of a sudden, in the middle of a song that he was singing, someone came over and whispered into his ear. He stopped, and he uh, got up and made an announcement. The bodies of Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney have just been discovered. They were buried deep in the earth. There wasn't any shouting. Uh, there was just silence. I saw lips moving as though they were in prayer. He asked us to join hands and sing, We shall overcome, uh -huh, my Lord. We shall overcome. Someday we shall overcome. Call late in the evening, at least this um, this nightmare of unknowing, um, or at least not officially knowing, um, was over. The bodies of Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner were flown to New York. They had a separate funeral there. Fanny Lee Cheney flew to New York to be at that funeral. Uh, the families by then were so together, even though they had never met before. The mothers locked arms and walked out of the church together. In Mississippi, a memorial service was held for James Cheney.
the decision had been made by family members and local leaders and others that they want to keep this very quiet um, and then low key rather than that their eulogy. I want to talk about is really what I really grieve about. I don't grieve for Cheney because the fact I feel that he lived a fuller life than many of us will ever live. I feel that he's gotten his freedom. He was still fighting for it. Dave Dennis's speech was a turning point in the summer because everybody wanted him to say the usual things that you would say at a funeral. And Dave say. Dennis just couldn't do it. He challenged the people at the memorial, and he challenged the whole movement. You see, we all tired. You see, I know what's going to happen. I feel it deep in my heart when they find the people who killed those guys in the Shoba County. All the different emotions and things that have been going through um, leading up to this particular moment began to, to come out, boil up, and we might call this. And then looking out there and seeing Ben Cheney, James Cheney's little brother, I lost it. I totally just lost it. Don't bow down anymore. Hold your heads up. We want our freedom now. I don't want to have to go to another memorial. I'm tired of funerals. So the music is very powerful in that, among other elements. Tell us what, why you chose this clip and what. Well, I, you know, I, I thought that that we start, I was talking to you on the phone, and you know, I, I think that 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 clip was just pure emotion. You know, we weren't trying to give you any kind of new information. It was just pure emotion. We were trying to, you know, give you a sense of the feeling, you know, of. of of that summer and the frustration and, and how people felt when these bodies, you know, were finally discovered and just to, just to put you there and to give you, you know, that feeling. Um, I, as, as it was playing, I, I, I leaned over and said to you, one of the things that was really funny for us was, you know, we have um, the one guy singing and it kind of um, dissolves into the whole group singing, We Shall Overcome. and. Uh, Somebody told me later on, well, you know, that, that only works because they're singing in the same key. And I was like, uh, <laughs> More divine intervention. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I just think, can we dissolve those two together? And it, and, it, and, it kind of, and it kind of really worked. But, you know, right there, again, we're just trying to, trying to, trying to give you, you know, that the full emotion and, and, and bring you along and, 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 and make you feel as much as, you, as we can, you know, um, what Dave Dennis is feeling you know, when he finally just breaks down. I mean, and that is, you know, a, a very famous speech, and it's a very different kind of speech than you see, you know, in, in, from, from the Civil Rights Movement, you know, where he's really, you know, challenging the, the, the people in the South, you know, okay, enough, we've got to stand up. So before we talk about your next film, which in some, your current film, which in some ways grows right out of Den Dave Dennis's disillusion, or one could see right. that link, let me ask you something quite different, which is a huge cultural phenomenon these last past, past few months has been the film Selma, which also looks at the civil rights movement, but from the point of view not of documentary, but feature film and, and um, fiction. And, and, I mean, it's based on a historical uh, set of realities, but it's a film in which the filmmaker has a lot more leeway about how to portray characters and to um, convey emotion. So you have done this extraordinary research, so you get a clip like this, or you get the convergence of these uh, amazing um, research efforts and, and the ability to present emotion, in fact. How do you think about a film like Selma and what it does in comparison to how you approach telling stories of the same era? Have you thought about those comparisons at all? Or? Um, I, I don't know if I compare them. You know, I mean, Selma's a film that I, I, I admired a, a great deal, you know. Um, 
because I think it was, you know, you know, very true to the the, the feeling of, mm -hmm. of of the movement, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's for me, it's fun seeing a, a bunch of people that that I that I know and have interviewed, you know, kind of portrayed by actors on on, mm -hmm. on the screen. Um, and I I, th I think it's it's great, you know, to get the story out there any way you can, you know. So, you know, obviously, you know, Selma's going to attract millions and millions of people. It's going to attract different a different set of people. But I think, you know, what it does is may is maybe interest people in that whole era, and 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 interest people in history. You know, the idea that mm -hmm. history can be is is something that's that's very, you know, dramatic. It's, uh, this is and, pretty dramatic. Too. Yeah, and can and, and, and can be you know entertaining. I mean mm -hmm. that's 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 finally you know I think one of the things that I'm trying to do you know is is entertain people. I mean you know it's um you know um, you want people to be entertained. You know um, you know I, the, one of the best compliments I ever got was you know we screened the murder of Emmett Till. At, at Sundance, they have what they call community screenings in Salt Lake City, and and they bus in a whole bunch of uh, teenagers, you know, from from Salt Lake City high schools, you know, and they're like, you know, Salt Lake, um, Utah's 80% Mormon or something, so I guess they're 80% Mormon, and you know, we showed them the the murder of Emmett Till, and this young, you know, 16-year-old white girl comes out, and I'm kind of standing outside, and she walks by, and she says, that was good. <laughs> That's, that's all I'm looking for, you know, that's all. That's great. So you have a new film that's going to be showing at the Brattle later this month. Uh -huh. Tell us about that, and, okay. and let's look at the final clip, which is from that. Yeah, so, so we just finished a film uh, called The Black Panther's Vanguard of the Revolution, which is uh, kind of a history of the, the Black Panther Party. Um, let's see where to start. So the film, we, we finished the film in January. It premiered at Sundance Film Festival this January. It's gone on. It was a... Uh, Opening night at Doc Fortnite at Museum of Modern Art. It was opening night at Pan African Film Festival. We just it was just screened Saturday night at Full Frame Film Festival in North Carolina. Um, we had a thousand people. It was the <laughs> biggest theater I've ever been in, but a thousand people. We just found out today that Human Rights Watch. Is that, am I got that right? It's going to be closing night at Human Rights Watch in New York, but it's going to be here on on, on uh, April 27th. Um, at the Brattle as part of a film festival, I think it's called the Underground Independent Film Festival of Boston. So please come out, it's April 27th. So we're just in the middle of that, uh, and it's gonna be released in theaters. Um, and it's coming, in one, one place it will be released in theaters is in Boston in the fall. So it starts with Film Forum in New York, and then it goes to theaters all, all over the country, kind of, you know, art house theaters. So, you know, um, I think we're in 13 cities at the present. Um, and I should talk, can I talk about my little Kickstarter campaign? Yes. So, first time ever in my life, we have a Kickstarter campaign. So we have these cards that are at a table back in the back, and I've got some if you're interested, um, which is a total something new <laughs> to, to do. I don't know if anybody's run a Kickstarter campaign. But, but what, so what's happened is, is PBS is putting in money to get the film released, but we need more money to get, to just kind of really do a robust uh, theatrical release. So we're. We're doing our first ever Kickstarter campaign. But one thing I've learned, you know, because we, we started a week ago today, is, is one thing that Kickstarter does besides raise money is its publicity. Is it, you know, people talk to people and, 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 and it goes out and they then send emails or tweets or whatever to other people about it. And it's this kind of real publicity for the film, you know, without a lot of publicity money. And so that's, that's a great thing for, for us. So the film is, is doing real well. It's, a, it's a kind of a whole other side of, of the civil rights movement. One of the things that's really interesting is that um, Freedom Summer, one of the last thing that happens in the, in the Freedom Summer film is that you see Stokely Carmichael when he stands up and says, you know, we want black power. Black power, black power. He starts to yell black power. And that's the, one of the first things that you hear in the Black Panther film um, it is uh, him talking, yelling, black power, black power, black power. So there's this direct connection between, you know, the, all these pieces of, of the movement. Um, chapters. Chapters, yeah. I, I'm, very, I'm very proud of, the, proud of the Black Panther film. I think it's, um, it's a very exciting film, and it's something that you haven't seen before. We talked to a lot of people who were part of the Panther movement 
who are part of what you call rank and file, who are just in the movement. We talked to cops uh, in, in LA and Oakland. We talked to FBI informants. Um, it's kind of a, we use a lot of FBI documents, which you can now get, so you really see, um, you know, J. Well, J. Edgar Hoover's destruction of, of the party. Um, and you also see the party destroy itself from within. So I, I, it's, uh, it's been exciting, and I'm, I'm very proud of this. And we have a trailer. And we have the trailer. So, so this is not a clip. What, what, what you've been seeing were kind of you know, clips of the film. This is more like a trailer, different scenes that we put together. The thing that led to the Panthers was what we were seeing on television every day, attack dogs, fire hoses, bombings. We stand on the eve of a black revolution, brothers. I was a cocktail waitress in a white strip club two years before I joined the Black Panther Party. How did that happen? The rage was in the streets. It was everywhere. I say that Ronald Reagan is a punk, a sissy, and a coward. And I challenge you to a duel. Eldridge had this incredible ability to encapsulate a thought that stabbed right into the heart of the enemy. Now, was he insane? Fuck yeah. That boy was crazy. They were trying to change government as we know it to terrorist uh, activity. The state assembly was in the midst of a heated debate when the young Negroes, armed with loaded rifles, shotguns, and pistols, marched into the Capitol. Do you feel the nation is in trouble? I think very definitely it is. What is the answer? The answer is vigorous law enforcement. How about justice? Justice is merely incidental to law and order. The FBI saw the Panthers as a very, very threatening and violent revolutionary movement. They absolutely wanted this organization to be destroyed. I felt absolutely free. I was a free Negro. In that little space I had, I was the king. And that's what I felt. The great strength of the Black Panther Party was its ideals and its youthful vigor and enthusiasm. The great weakness of the party was its ideals and its youthful vigor and its enthusiasm. That sometimes can be very dangerous, especially when you're up against the United States government. Can't wait to see it. So now, Jonathan, you have some questions from people that they would like to pose. Absolutely. I'd like a lot of them. Please pick up your questions and, and cards, and please write them down. Professor Guineer, we'd love a question from you. Um, and while she's doing that, I actually want to ask the first question, if you don't mind. Um, Mr. Nelson, we witnessed and you discussed the 12-year-old white girl in Mississippi who essentially was forced to leave, for aiding, leave town for aiding Freedom Riders. When I watch the films, it seems when you interview many of the local white leaders who upheld segregation, they often spoke about it theoretically. They would say things like, well, what you have to understand about the mindset at the time, you know, that sort of thing. Were there ever any respondents who were candid about and took full responsibility for their words and deeds in upholding segregation? And what did that look like and even feel like for you as a filmmaker? Um, yeah, I, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just forgetting the, the name of the uh, governor of... Um, Patterson? Patterson, right, of, of Alabama, Governor Patterson. I mean, I think Governor Patterson is very forthcoming. I think Governor Patterson, you know, um, it's, an, it's just an amazing, amazing interview um, with Governor Patterson as, you know, he talks about why he did what he did. Um, and he's not, you know, apologetic uh, uh, about it. I think one of the things as we were watching the clips that I, that I had meant to say, though, I think that one of the things that was really important to us in both Freedom Riders and Freedom Summer was that we used clips from people from back then because we really wanted to, to to give you and the audience um, the sense of what people were saying back then, you know, because it's impossible 
really almost for people now not to be reflect, reflective of, about what was happening. We really wanted to use the voices of, of people from back then. But I, I think, you know, you get it. The, you get the, the guy in uh, Freedom Riders who talks about, you know, I just wanted to hurt somebody. You know, I just felt like I just wanted to kill one of them. Um, so I, I think you get the sense. But I think one of the hardest things to find is actually someone from the South, you know, the Deep South, who's, who can, who's gonna talk about it um, as if they were still there. You know, um, we got the guy who, in uh, Freedom Summer, who was, was part of the Citizens uh, Council, who talks about it, you know, very openly, um, being part, part of the Citizens Council. And he's still uh, a, a, a segregationist and a racist. Is that William Scarborough? Is yeah, that do you know yeah. William Scarborough? I, there's a historian named William that's Scarborough. Him. That's him. That's yeah. him, he's a historian. He yeah, wrote a book him. called The Overseer. Yeah, that's him. That tells that, you something. That's right? him. Yeah. yeah, he and you know, I mean, he still. I mean, we were looking for for again that kind of you know, uh, unadulterated opinion, and people were like, uh, "Well, you should talk to William Scarborough," and we finally got to him, and and you know, that's what he feels. I mean, he feels that white people, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of white people who who have the same feelings that he does, but they just won't. They're 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 too politically correct to talk mm -hmm. about it, and he's not, and he's gonna you know, put it out there, and so he does. Um, <laughs> I have to say that the day it came to interview him, he wanted to chicken out and not be, really? <laughs> if I, not be interviewed, so we had to kind of talk him back into it, but you know, um, you know, he's pretty outspoken. I think you answered one of the questions we received, which was about whites in the Deep South in the 60s acting in such inhumane ways, and have you ever considered making a film to tell their story? I think that you just kind of answered that in terms of how candid people uh, would be. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think, I think that's a hard one to get. You know, it's really hard, I, and, and we struggle to get it because we look at, you know, I think that, that one of the things that, that I, I'm looking at, you know, to give an example in Freedom Riders is, is how, you know, how it makes sense, how it made sense to somebody to try to kill people because they were sitting together in the front of a bus. You know, so what is it that, that how does that make sense? Um, and um, I think that, that, that we do a fairly good job of, of giving an idea of the Southern mindset. But I think that, that one of the things that was really important to us was, the, again, to use clips from back then. Mm -hmm. So you really hear from people back then talking about how they felt. Mm -hmm. Here's a great question. Um, as many of the Freedom Riders and Freedom Summer participants were students, can you speak, speak to the ways university administrators related to their activism? Did university presidents think their students were going about making change in the quote unquote right way? Um, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I think in general, um, at that point, the students were leading the faculty. In most, in most instances, you know, a lot of the, the, the Freedom Riders were begged kind of not to go, not to do it. Um, you know, you should wait, you should be more cautious. You know, and that's just the, 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 the way things are sometimes. You know, there were the, but then there were also faculty who were really part of it. But I think that a lot of times, you know, for um, the young people's schools and their parents, you know, were, wanted them to, to be a little bit more cautious than they were. I think that that, in general, is, is how it worked. Uh, here's another question. Someone raised the point about the civil rights movement being 40, 50 years ago, and, but now the movement for rights continues with environmental movement, police shooting, wage inequality, and other issues for change. Um, and they're asking about the, pr these present day realities in related to past movements. I actually want to build upon that and kind of frame the question in this way. In terms of your own animating moral impulses as a filmmaker, do you see the connection, and are you intentional about uh, this? Or oftentimes in the academy, you know, we'll kind of hide behind disciplines and we'll say, oh, as a historian, I'm just, you know, telling the story. But if you could speak a little bit about your own moral impulses that drive your work. Well, I'm not a historian. So <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I hope that 
the, the films that, that I make don't live in what I call a historical bubble. We're not, you know, I mean that, I, I hope that they exist, you know, as, as a historical record, but I, the, the whole, I think the whole point is, is, is to kind of drive us forward, I hope, um, that, you know, one, one of the things, somebody asked me, you know, is, is, is why don't you, you know, like go forward in, in Freedom Summer and say, but, and today, you know, we were able to elect a black president. Well, I, I don't think you, you have to do that in the film. I think those connections we make as an, as an audience. But I do hope that, that, that there is something that, that people get out of these films that, that relates to their lives today. You know, um, both Freedom Summer and Freedom Riders have been used by uh, groups all over the country and all over the world, you know. Um, one of the, the, the greatest things that, that, that happened to me, you know, probably in my filmmaking career was I saw, I was at a conference with, with um, the people who made the film The Square about the uh, revolution in Egypt and the guy, I introduced myself who made The Square and he said, oh my God, we watched your films in The Square. Oh you know, my gosh. We watched your films, they motivated us. I was like, you know, oh my God, I, you know, what could I say, you know? To that, so I, I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that, that that's what you know the, these films do. Um, when we did Freedom Riders, one of the, the immigrant groups, immigrant rights groups, and immigrants uh, picked up that film. You know, something we'd never thought about, but you know, they, they just took it and ran. You know, and and did all this stuff with the film to where we had to really try to catch up so that we could help them. You know, use the film as a tool and organizing tool. So you know, I mean, I think that that that. Hopefully the, the films will be used. Um, for the Black Panther film, we, I did a, a, a New York Times Opdox, which you can still get if you know, go to New York Do Times Opdox, which directly compares it to uh, you know, what's going on in Ferguson and, and New York and other places in the country you know, with, with the Black Panthers, who, you know, for those who don't know, the Black Panthers started in Oakland, California uh, as a group that, that followed the police around um, and just watched the police because of the police brutality that they were witnessing and had witnessed for years in, in Oakland. That's how the Panthers started. You, you, President Faust already asked you a question about Selma. Uh, many of us in this room last night, we watched Freedom Summer and, um, and several, many, many clips of Lyndon B. Johnson. <laughs> Someone from the audience actually asked a question about how you feel about the controversy of the Selma movie in terms of the representation of Lyndon Johnson as a lackluster civil rights leader, uh, according to this, you know, I'm quoting the question. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, I'm, I'm not a historian, but I, I think it's very clear, you know, if you see uh, Freedom Summer, you know, where Lyndon Johnson stood a year before that. Um, and, and, so, and, and so, you know, I, I, think, it's, I think it's, I think it's important that, that we relook at, at, at you know Lyndon Johnson in, in Freedom Riders, the Kennedys, you know, don't come off you know as the heroes that, that we look at look at them as. But, but I think what's important again is that so many times you know these these people are pulled by the movement, they're pulled forward, and 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 that's what's important. You know, you know the the Kennedys didn't end up where they started. They were pulled by the movement. They were forced to change. Lyndon Johnson, you know, was forced to change. Um, and that's really important that, that we understand. And again, you know, these people were forced to change by young people. It was young people who, who led these movements. And young people, you know, who, who, who forced uh, this country to change. Making these movies how have you kept the faith regarding civil rights? Three-part question. How have you kept the faith? Why haven't you, quote, unquote, gone Hollywood? And how about Attica as your next film? Oh, <laughs> That's really funny. That's really funny. OK, so I, can I, I'll, I'll answer that one first. It was actually, I want, I want to do a film about Attica very, 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 very badly. I don't know if it'll ever happen. We actually, when we started Freedom Summer, I had an idea that we could do Attica and Freedom Summer to, at the same time. For the, we could take the money that we had for Freedom Summer and just shoot Attica at the same time and, and, and do 
two films at once, you know, without, for the price of one, without telling anybody. But it became too complicated and, and, and it, couldn't, it couldn't happen. But Attica is something I would love, I, you know, it's something I, I actually have written a proposal. I would really love for it to happen. But, you know, making film, raising the money to make films is just a very, very complicated and long process. And you, I, for me, I have to be fully committed to doing that because it's impossible to do it. It just doesn't happen. Um, what was the first part of that three-part question? Uh, you're, you're keeping the faith. Oh, I, I, at, I, I, so go ahead, keeping I, I mean, the faith. I think, you know, the, the stories make me keep the faith. I mean, these stories are, are incredible. I mean, they, they don't make me lose faith. They make me keep the faith. I mean, these people who battle, they're, they're, they're just incredible, incredible people, you know? And one of the greatest things for me, you know, uh, in, in my life is, is, is to be able to finish the films and then to be able to kind of, you know, show the film. So, you know, um, Two days ago, we were at Full Frame in North Carolina with a thousand people in the audience, and Kathleen Cleaver from the Black Panther Party was there with us and got a standing ovation when she got up on the stage. And, and to be able to be part of that, to be able to see Diane Nash from the Freedom Riders, you know, um, travel with her and, and get up on stage and get standing ovations, you know, and then and then and them tell me thank you is just incredible. I mean, I would cry, I'll cry now if, if you wanna see it. You know, I, you know, I can cry at a, at a drop of a hat, you know, when, when I talk about them saying thank you to me because, you know, I owe everything I have to them. Like I started out saying, when I grew up, there was no black man sitting up here talking about being a film director. That was fantasy. You know, and if it wasn't for Diane Nash and Kathleen Cleaver and Bob Moses and those people, I wouldn't be sitting here. So, you know, um, it, it's not about losing the faith. I mean, they're, they're the ones who give me faith. And the final part of that one, I guess with the success of, you know, these kind of uh, um, uh, biopics, Ray Charles, James Brown, Selma, why haven't you gone Hollywood? Well, I mean, if you give me ten million dollars, I'll make one. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, I, 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 I like what I do. You know, I mean, I, it's it, it's not easy to raise money, but it, it's it's much easier. You know, psychically, for me to raise money from the people I have to talk to, than have to go to Hollywood and raise money if that makes any sense at all. Uh, two more questions. And uh, actually, there's one comment um, I'll say before the question. And someone made a comment about the importance of this work for young people and how young people, their knowledge of this history is so anemic and the ways that we could get this information into high schools and, and to the teachers and on syllabuses and syllabi and the like. I was wondering, um, maybe this is actually a time to talk about the role that PBS plays with the American experience and some of the resources that are, that are actually available uh, to teachers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, that, that PBS and, and American Experience does, does whatever they can, you mm -hmm. know, um, to do that. Um, the, the films that we're doing now, we're doing, you know, the Black Panthers, we're, it's a, we're doing a trilogy, the Black Panthers is the first. We're doing another film we're just starting now on historic black colleges and universities and, and kind of the shaping of, of the black middle class in America and, and through, through that story. And then a four hour film on the Atlantic slave trade and the business of the slave trade and that we're doing separately from American experience. And you know, we're doing the same kind of thing to get this, these films you know, into classrooms, to break them up into smaller units, you know, to do everything we can. I think part of it is, is also in the production of the film. You know, we try to, you know, I try to think about young people because so many of these films are, are young people's story. And so I try to think about a film that has a pace um, that young people can follow and young people will like. I have 16-year-old twins, so they're my test. Um, and uh, they, you know, when I hear them singing, you know, Got to Free Huey from the Black Panther film, I know that at least it's made some impression. But, you know, I mean, I think that, that they really liked Freedom Riders, Freedom Summer, and the Panthers, they like a lot because, um, again, we're trying to, to give it a pace that um, they can understand and, and is exciting to them. Mm -hmm. And it gives, you know, this was a, these are exciting stories. These were, you know, life and death, literally, life and death stories and roller coasters. Mm -hmm. 
How would you comment on the thriller in 1988, Mississippi Burning on Freedom Summer, and its social impact and perhaps implication for later works on the topic? Who asked that question? <laughs> you did. No. Who, who asked that question? I, I, Mississippi Burning is, is a horrible, horrible film, okay? Let's face it, it's just awful. It's just awful. And I mean, and, and, and that's not, and that's not be being opinionated, you know? I mean, there's a story that, that says the FBI, you know, were the heroes, and the heroic FBI, you know, when J. Edgar Hoover refused to do anything, you know? Um, during Freedom Rides, you know, you know, J., you know the, the FBI watched the Freedom Riders get beat, and said, you know, that's not, our job is not to, we're not law enforcement officers, we're investigators. You know, they never, nobody was ever f prosecuted for, by any evidence he asked me. So I, anyway, the question was about Mississippi Bernie. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of really a, a, a terrible, terrible, terrible film. I mean, and most people, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know if somebody was serious or just wanted me to go off. Is that what, <laughs> why they asked that? Give you that My wife asked that. I, <laughs> This is the fi final question of the night, and I'm actually going to kind of combine two questions here. Um, one is about the, and just kind of let you speak on this however you will, and, and let you give your concluding thoughts. One is about the kind of diverse and multidimensional phenomenon of what we call America, and what are some of the organizing principles that you might consider when making a movie, consider whether political doctrines, health protection, ideas of freedom. What are some of the organizing principles that might, that help you, I would say, tell these stories in more complicated ways? But then also someone asked about uh, a kind of transnational dimension or more a diasporic approach. So linking, for example, these sorts of movements against injustice, racism, segregation, and say with apartheid in South Africa. And uh, might you ever consider that direction? Um, the first question part of it, I had no idea what you were saying, so I don't know what that was about. Um, the, uh, the second, you know, I, who knows? I mean, I, 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 at one point we were really trying to, to, to work on a film um, about the way race was looked at, you know, in uh, the United States, in South Africa, and in Brazil you know, and kind of comparing those three places because I think it's very, very interesting, you know, and, and, and that, that they, there, there's this slight, there's like a twist and a twist and a twist on how race is looked at, you know. Um, um, so it, we just, it, just never, it just never happens. Who knows, who knows if it will, it might. Um, so, it's, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, there's so many great stories out there and so many, you know, uh, different ways to tell them. I just don't, you know, I, I, I don't know where, you know, it's going to go. Um, but right now we have the Black Panthers. Right that now. will be at Brattle Street. Wait a minute. Right now we. <laughs> Black Panthers will be at Brattle Street on <laughs> April 27th. Yeah, we'll be on at April 27th. Please, please come out and, and see it. it. It is kind of a, you know, a really an, an advanced screening. Um, uh, and then it will open up here in Boston in the fall. Um, and, and be around in, in the fall. And um, I, I would love, you know, if, if you can, get, get one of these cards and, and they'll tell you how to, to get the Kickstarter information. And again, Kickstarter, you know, as, as I'm learning, is not all about, it, about contributing money. It's about, like, getting out there to your, it's a whole new way of, of getting people to, to know about films, you know, because we don't have the money to, we'll never have the money in the best of all possible worlds to, you know, have a commercial on during the NBA Finals, okay. you know, or during the Super Bowl, you know. We just, we just don't have that kind of money. But there are other ways that we find out about stuff. There are other ways that, that things happen. And uh, that's, well, that's one of the ways that, that films are spreading. So it would be great, there's cards back there. But I, and I hope you guys get to see the film. I'd love to hear what you think. Please, everybody, join me in showing your love for Mr. Stanley Nelson and President Drew Faust. It was Thank fun. You. That was great. Thank it was you. Great.